start recording the yeah um, it's recording now it's recording well, can somebody please pin uh, sudha ma'am's uh, uh, video so that it's uh, full screen how does that work okay uh, abhijit your co-host i think you manage that yes yes i've done i've pinned her okay wonderful thank you so much um Okay, well, um, first of all, I just want to start. This is- uh, I think you should just keep it in GG. Hmm? Okay, I'm not sure. Okay. Are we doing a technical thing that I don't understand or? Uh, you know, just uh, if, if, if it's okay, I will start uh, Sarela. Maybe you can- Okay. 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 All right. So <laughs> formally, let me introduce uh, uh, Sudha Chechi. I call her Sudha Chechi because Chechi, the word Chechi in in uh, Malayalam, which is the language that is spoken over here in Kerala, it means older sister. And uh, so the Chechi is uh, is an older sister and an inspiration and uh, so much more uh, for me. And uh, it's also because I feel that closeness with her, uh, that I feel that uh, I'm she's part of my family, I'm a part of her family. And it's is that closeness with that closeness that I refer to her as uh, Sudha Chechi, but she is also uh, uh, a great personality, uh, a very large personality in India. Uh, she has uh, started one of the most uh, uh, well known, popular, especially among the youth, uh, movements uh, in culture, in Indian culture. Uh, this was way back, even like uh, I think 10, 15 years ago. Uh, Sudha Chi started this. Uh, her full name is Sudha Gopalakrishnan. Sorry, I, I introduced her formally. Formally, her name is Sudha Gopalakrishnan, Dr. Sudha Gopalakrishnan. Uh, she's very, a very uh, well accomplished academist, um, but she's most popularly known for this uh, um, uh, thing that she started is called Sahapedia, which is like an online encyclopedia of Indian culture. So, who more appropriate? to actually address this class than uh, Sudha Chichi, who started probably the first most modern uh, way of actually mapping and uh, uh, chronicling Indian culture in, in all, all its uh, aspects. And uh, so I would like you to all welcome uh, Sudha Chichi, Dr. Sudha Gopalakrishnan for this to this class. I will give you a little bit more detail on her accomplishments. Um, she, uh, also was responsible for a really uh, impressive project that was uh, uh, on archiving uh, manuscripts, the traditional palm manuscripts across India. This is uh, something that uh, Ma'am uh, Sudha Chechi did for the, uh, uh, I, let me get the actual technical name right for this, uh, this thing. I know I have to look at my notes for the exact uh, for the national arc uh, Indian National Mission for Manuscripts, and this she did between two thousand and three and two thousand and seven. Uh, and just let me give you an idea about what manuscripts are. Traditional ancient uh, uh, writings were written on palm leaves, and uh, a lot of these were decaying and in bits, and in lots of it were in private collection. And she was solely responsible for mapping these manuscripts across the country and digitizing them and in, in the process, preserving them for eternity. And it's something that the entire Indian civilization will be grateful to her for this effort and finding this effort. And uh, it's such a treasure that she has left with us. And, and, and not, not just this manuscripts also, like I said, Sahapedia also is the same, same kind of an effort is to preserve uh, of this uh, this heritage that we have in the form of culture. Uh, she did her uh, uh, doctoral research actually uh, on comedy and she worked on uh, translating Shakespeare's plays into Malayalam. Uh, she has uh, published eight books, several papers, uh, translate in the uh, field of Indian literature, uh, performing arts and aesthetic theory. Uh, she herself is an embodiment of aesthetics uh, when she talks, when she walks, in how she dresses. Uh, she is really a picture of poetry, if you ask me. And uh, for these, and, and I can go on, she's got so many more accomplishments. She is the visiting fellow at Cornell 
University Professional Fellow at the National University of Education and Planning and Administration at NUEPA in Delhi. Um, uh, she has uh, uh, she has uh, prepared uh, the nomination dossiers and management plans, uh, which led to Kudiyattam, which is a very traditional performing art uh, in uh, Kerala. Uh, the uh, also the oral tradition of the Vedas and Vedic heritage uh, and Ram Leela and uh, several masterpieces of intang intangible heritage of humanity. She's been very closely associated with the UNESCO in terms of pre preserving the intangible uh, cultural heritage of this country. And uh, so it's my great pleasure and honor to have uh, her speak to us. And indeed, that even this talk that uh, she will be giving us is yet another thing that we preserve uh, with us in our hearts and in our minds, a little taste of for Indian culture. Um, so the Chechi, a little bit about the class. The class is a very eclectic class. They are studying sustainable development at Amrita. Um, so that means, you know, their hearts are big. They want to do something wonderful for society. And you know that they're in Amrita, so they must have that already. They come from all over the world, India, of course, but also half the class is not from India. They're from Africa, from the Middle East, from the US, from Brazil, uh, South America, and also from the East, the Far East. So it's a very diverse group. They're, this class and is, is supposed to be an introduction to Indian culture. It's turning out to be more of an appreciation of Indian culture, kind of that has a slant like that. So yes, thank you so much for being here with us and taking the time. Thank you so much, Dr. Bhavani and Sarila. And I'm so, I can't tell you how delighted I am to be here, uh, that I'm here now today. And this has been something that I really was talking to you, Dr. Bhavani. Also, I wanted this to be more like a physical, uh, uh, and we were talking about that for some time, but now as the situation emerges right now, that doesn't happen. That doesn't matter, but I think, you should not have introduced me in this kind of, you know, elaborate, undeserved terms, but thank you all the same. Uh, I must also say that I have very rich memories of my visit to Amritapuri, to Amachi Labs, to also the, also visiting uh, and uh, calling on uh, Amma, the Venerable Amma, for, and taking her blessings. All this is a cherished memory, and I hope that at some future this can, can this, I can do that again and are we always in touch with, um, with the center and I'll be so happy with the university. And right now with this class of students, which you've very kindly introduced to me, I am sharing some thoughts that I hope will be of some interest and some relevance to this class. Um, I, have, I, have, I didn't know what to say, how to say, so I have anyway, uh, made this, I mean, that, that made my caption as literature, as bridging cultures and Indian perspective. Um, in fact, I consciously introduced the word bridging to talk about culture. So the bridging cultures, what, so what, what is a bridge? Uh, in my understanding, there are two things about a bridge. Bridge is one that connects and bridge that crosses a barrier. So that it, it's a two-way connection. You can go to one side, you can also come to the other side. So in a way, it's the kind of cross-cultural uh, called cross-cultural medium. And secondly, of course, it is also a two-way process. You can go, you can come. So these two, this I'm thinking not so much as a physical bridge, but as a metaphor to talk about something about cross-cultural understanding, about how cultures go from one place to the other and how they get localized there, how they become, they come into their own. So this is the main, the main topic of my lecture today. Um, so uh, what is this inheritance? We, we are always used to talking about culture as inheritance, as some kind of uh, heritage. So in one sense, what is this inheritance that we are talking about when we talk about culture? Uh, this is um, a, a, right from ancient times to now, people have found ingenious ways to preserve and pass on their knowledge through formal and informal ways of communication and preservation. 
while looking at this broad sweep of such transmission of resources of knowledge resources through centuries we can see that there is some kind of recurrent patterns for their dispersion that may directly or indirectly influence the, the development of literature of many many countries so in india talking about india i said it's an indian perspective so i will broadly talk about india but also connected to what happens to other other cultures so to say in india oral transmission of knowledge still continues to be one of the most important methods for communicating messages educating children on early lessons learning scriptures or texts transmitting stories and nurturing knowledge about life and art much of india's sacred literature myths epics uh, such as for example the mahabharata and the ramayana india's epics medicinal expertise tales ballads legends songs and even a multitude of knowledge of say for example medicinal knowledge or knowledge about nature about ecology all this was carried on through a kind of largely flexible mode of communication uh, and transmission um uh, coming to um, to oral literatures there were professional storytellers who were attached to temples who used to go around villages who narrated stories from the ramayana and the mahabharata and this class of storytellers told and retold these epics puranas as they called the epics legends that not only in temples but also in public spaces across the country so these different texts and traditions emerged with local variations and stories and sub stories according to the context began to be enhanced and then integrated into the main plot so stories of local knowledge continuously extended the narrative through interpolations through conscious augmentation and embedding sub narratives with the interpretive skills of these storytellers even complex ideas became accessible to a wider audience i mean we see this every time we see this all over india or or anywhere for that matter so um this this is one aspect but there's a second aspect in which dr bhavani was just talking about about vedic knowledge which is the scriptural the india scriptural or the philosophical knowledge which is which we are talking about a large corpus of texts in india which went on through a very complex highly codified method of transmission there there was no scope of any improvisation any augmentation elaborate highly sophisticated and full proof method methods of transmission were used to instruct and memorize these compositions which eliminated or reduced so so to say decreased the danger of losing a single word syllable or accent you can just imagine there is this huge corpus right from the vedas the four vedas their ancillary vedas pada patha the different different kinds of the shakhas that emerged the branches that came the the philosophies the rituals it's such a huge complex of knowledge but that how how could it be transmitted the basic step for learning this vedas is called pada patha straight forward narration when you narrate it from one uh, straight forward splitting them word by word combining with other hand gestures postures so to say with appropriate sound patterns infused slowly graduating to the next level of recitational complexity and then again going one by one one by one and so that's a very very uh, complex method of understanding um, so this went on for centuries and um, not just about indian uh, about the veda for example this same thing happened i'm sure across the world before texts were consigned to memory but the text became uh, 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 manuscripts or you know uh, became uh, committed to uh, to, uh, to to written material so for example the tripitaka textual corpus in pali again that also was handed down orally the buddhist tradition again through a very very strong monastic tradition across countries where buddhism took root 
So that also was very incredibly fail safe methods of translator of transmission by uh, training and educating the monks for in countries, for example, such as Korea, Tibet, Thailand, Laos, and all those places. So this went on like this, but at one point of time, so a certain point of time, um, there are inscriptional records sometime in the, in the beginning of the first millennium, initially in Prakrit and later, when these started getting codified into, into um, um, written form, into the written form. And that sort of happened across India and also across, across these, lang these places that I'm talking about. Perhaps the, it was, uh, um, the, uh, it started getting written in, for example, materials such as stones or copper plates, birch bark, palm leaves, and then later a parchment, and later after that through in handwritten paper, hand handmade paper. These were in India. These were composed in different different languages and scripts, and spread all, not just in India but all over the Asian region in mathas, in monasteries, in temples, institutions, libraries, and private collections. So these are still available, very much available in India. Uh, and and uh, and um, are are now what uh, what Bhavani was talking, Dr. Bhavani was talking about about the uh, about the National Mission for Manuscripts so was one effort to put it all together. So this is um, uh, so the first I don't know whether you know which which is the first manuscript that the for the earliest manuscript that India has. Uh, I don't know whether anyone knows the name. It is called the Gilgit manuscripts because it was discovered in Gilgit a place between Afghanistan and Kashmir by a group of shepherds in 1931. And sometime, it may have been written sometime in the sixth century or fifth century AD uh, after, after uh, the CE. It is a collection of Buddhist writings co covering a wide range of subjects like re religion, ritual, philosophy, icon iconometry, even there are some folk tales and uh, and also the, mainly from the Buddhist canon. The same th thing applies to South and Southeast Asia also. They also possess, the, the, these countries also possess uh, an immense number and range of manuscripts in multiple languages, cultures, and regions that in a way, I, this is a little too big a topic for me to talk in this, in this paper, but, um, there is, a, there is a great deal of scripture, philosophy, different faith systems, and even community knowledge that are found in, this, in, this, uh, uh, in these corpuses that are there. Now, um, when this happens, um, uh, uh, when a text becomes, I mean, adapts itself into from one, one cultural domain to another, there, like I said, there are these two, three medium through which it gets expressed. One is spoken, spoken language. Then what I said is written. The third is performative. The first language to be used in early inscriptions in India was Prakrit, followed mostly um, by, um, uh, by Sanskrit, not merely in English, uh, 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 not merely English, but uh, in Sanskrit, but also as a, uh, as a language of liturgical and courtly use, and also in transaction. Slowly, this language came to wield a lot of influence in India and Southeast Asia. And also, I, 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 you may have heard of the name Dr. Professor Sheldon Pollock, he, who uses the name Cosmopolis to describe this trans-regional power, power, culture power that that the Sanskrit exercised across across India, across the region, the larger region of South and Southeast Asia. So that that has become a, 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 even, for example, places like Java, Sumatra, the Malaysian region, and also the spread of Sanskrit and Pali as adaptation as an original language to suit a local context was very very pervasive. But like I said, slowly the local languages came to be used. And all that became uh, came to be called um, um, Mani Pravala. What uh, what I was uh, uh, what I would like to to call it as Mani Pravala, which is the 
coral and pearl, which when they're combined, they become a kind of garland. So this is something like that. I mean, two languages coming together and they're making a different language with its own, its own cultural traits and also its own beautiful literature. So this is called Mani Pravala. So such things became very, very, very pervasive across India. So these are some of the things that I wanted to say, but there are also other things, for example, how Indian literature pervaded, pervaded uh, the, uh, the South and Southeast Asia. Of course, you know that Indian literature is not of one language, of one, um, uh, uh, there are, India has this plurality of languages, multiple languages, what we call as Sanskrit and Pali are very, very, one of the things, I mean, there are more than 22 uh, languages recognized by the age schedule. And there are more than 1,500 languages that are still spoken in India. And then there are, of course, dialects. Uh, you must also know that many of these languages are disappearing very fast. But each of them have a vibrant literature that, that informs them, their own versions of all these epics. Even the epics, um, uh, the Mahabharata, Ramayana, countless versions. Then there are translations. There are many, many, uh, many, many adaptations into performing arts. So these, the, there is so much of complexity and multiplicity that it has, uh, it has evolved in that it is, it is so, so difficult to talk about in the small, uh, in a, in the, in a, in limited time like this. But uh, I would like to, if anything, anybody wants to talk uh, or anybody wants to ask something, then we can. Take it from there and then we can talk again if you want to do that. I, I just want to ask a quick question. Can you explain a little bit the, the process of how they memorized um, the ancient texts, the Pada something, what it was? Where, can, you, can you explain exactly how that worked? Um, did you understand? I didn't get that question. Can you speak slightly loudly? What is the, what is that called, Bhavani? What's the word I'm looking for? When the uh, when the seers memorized the ancient texts, uh, or the sages or the monks, how did they do it? They you said they did it in a specific form, where yes. they separated the words. But um, how did they? Can you explain that a bit more on how the process worked? All right. Yeah. I, yes. Yeah. Um, so there is, like I said, there is this very large corpus of texts at their hand. So there were these people who were only doing, only, only interested in, uh, they were not interested in the meaning of these verses. They were only, they were like a computer. They were consigning them into memory, into the brain, that is. I mean, this is what actually the UNESCO recognition was all about, not so much about the meaning of the verses, not, which of course has, there are many, many scholars who interpreted them, who took, who took it further, who made uh, a huge um, uh, commentaries on them. So that is another part of knowledge. What I'm talking about uh, right now to you is about transmission of this corpus. How did it happen? The one thing, very strong insistence on a Guru Shishya Parampara, a master to disciple tradition in which the master would recite certain portion of the text through strict insistence on the Akshara, Matra, Kala, the time, the, the, um, the, the syllable and the, and the uh, alphabet. So it will be like one with this much, a small uh, portion will be repeated again and again and again, like that, that, that is one way, the direct way. Then there is another way in which they go two, two words, two, two stanzas forward, then two backwards. So that, you know, there are many, many mnemonic recitational methods. There are about five or six types of methods that they use to consign each and every syllable. That's why it is universal. For example, the same, they say that Vedic material when they learned is the same throughout the same be it in Maharashtra or be it in Kerala or be it in uh, Tamil Nadu the the method of recitation is the same and then so that is that is the kind of fail safe method that I was talking about in in uh, in Vedic transmission and on the other hand the folk method like I said when the itinerant travelers travel uh, people who 
folk people who recited Ramayana or the Mahabharata or the different stotras, and that was a different kind of, or even stories from, that was a different kind of method by which they used to uh, say something. They were, for example, you may have heard about things like Pandwani, in which you just recite about, uh, uh, about say, 10 lines or something, then you explicate the meaning. And then the reciters also add their own understanding of what the, so that is how a huge, huge corpus, I mean, unbelievably huge corpus developed in India, especially in the two epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, which had several, like I said, several versions and tellings and different. And I wanted to talk to you about one aspect of it, which is, um, uh, which is for example, the Ramayana, for example. I don't know whether you, many of you may have heard of this Dr. A.K. Ramanujan, who has written about 300 Ramayanas, you know, 300 Ramayanas in India. Actually, it is the biggest understatement of, you know, I would like to say 3,000 Ramayanas. In India, every, every version is a new version. For example, according to the need, according to the context, according to the place, according to the community, our, this, these uh, texts kept, uh, kept improvising, extending, and you know, uh, making their own versions. And that is was just very remarkable about, uh, in, uh, about this uh, culture, I must say. So, um, uh, so uh, the same thing happened, for example, they went to Southeast Asia, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata traditions went to Southeast Asia also. Initially, of course, it went in the, in the Sanskrit, uh, as a Sanskrit text, but the, some of the texts that they have, they have their Ramakian, they have their many, many, uh, many, many versions that have developed in Southeast Asia, not necessarily from Valmiki's version. People who went for trade, who went for many uh, pilgrimage, they have, they, they had given their own version, sometimes folk version. So these versions added one thing to the other and became a huge corpus and then even the local cultures of those places also have had influences, not just on the text, but also on the performances, on the, so on the you know, the, on the different aspects of uh, literature. So this is what literature, as a literature, I wanted to talk about this, but also I want to talk something very specific about one, one um, text, which is, the, which is the Nala Nala story, if, of which I have some PPT also, which I sent to sent to sell. sell Ms. Sarala, I mean, she'll be showing you some paintings of that, which I had sent to them. So just to take one example, because the Ramayana and the Mahabharata are too big for this lecture, but I wanted to talk about the Nala story. I am sure many of you know about it, but I'd like to say that anyway. Uh, Nala story is a small sub story, which is, which is initially found in the mm -hmm. Mahabharata. This is a story uh, in the Vana Parva, in the third chapter of the Mahabharata, in which Yudhishthira, the king, asks, uh, he's, uh, when they're banished into the forest and they're going through many, many worries. And so he's asking the sage who comes and visits them, he's asking, see, look at our plight. We are, the, we are these princes and we are suffering this plight. Have you ever heard anybody who has gone through this kind of a plight and less suffering and this kind of suffering, have you ever heard? In an answer to this, the sage replies, don't think that this is only your, this suffering is only yours. There are many, many, for example, let me tell you the story of King Nala and Princess Damayanti, who have had to go through so much of suffering, but it is only through spiritual striving and faith and unstinted, I think, yeah, I think we can take it slightly later. Let me just, yeah, well, yeah, keep it there for now. Uh, uh, that we can, you know, so it is actually not just a story of, about a story about a love between the uh, between these two prince and the princess, but also how, uh, the, what shall I say, fortune tests them. I mean, uh, how fortune tests them to the maximum, and they go through all. I mean, whatever is possible. I mean, they these these are two people who got, who fell in love with each other. She is a beautiful princess and he of Vidarpa. And he is this great prince from, uh, uh, from Naishadha, Naishadha Rajya. They fall in love. And then there is this, this uh, the swan, there's this golden goose 
who acts as a go between for these two people. And somehow against many, many odds, they get married. Uh, even the gods want to, wanted to you know, come and come for the, for the wedding because they wanted to marry the Menti because she's so beautiful. And they send Nala himself as an emissary to the court saying that, please ask, uh, ask her to choose one of us, five of us, there are five gods, one of us to choose her. That you choose one of us. Uh, then he says, I am also, I'm sorry, I also am in love with her. He says, and she says, no, no, the, the gods say no, but you have to go. You have to go and take our message. So then he, they give him the, the uh, mantra of Tiraskarani, by which you can't see, so, she ha so that he can get into the forest, into the palace incognito. So he goes and visits Damenti. So he tries to tell him, he's very, very loyal to the gods. He says, no, you have to choose one of them as your husband. She says, no, I'm so, she, she doesn't know that this man is uh, Nala himself. He says, I'm so sorry. I'm not going to do that. I have Nala. I have already chosen Nala as my husband. I will only choose him. So then he is also very surprised that she's so steadfast in her love. Anyway, now even the gods are also happy, then they get married. But one evil spirit called Kali gets very angry with this, uh, with this insolence of this Damayanti, uh, so-called insolence. So he tries to separate them. So he, uh, they, 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 and there's a lot of incidents in between. Then he, they, they play a game of dice and then finally he is banished to the forest with the wife and then he loses everything. Ultimately, even these get set, these two people had to get separated. They, somehow they get separated. And finally, but, but then through all this, all this trials and tribulations, he keeps his faith, he's steadfast to his devotion. And her devotion is her faith and her total, uh, total bhakti, so to say, about her husband. So these two are the, are the themes that are very recurs again and again. So it is like testing, going through the worst um, uh, and then overcoming obstacles through spirituality, through faith, through belief in oneself and one's own core. That is said again and again in the Nala story. So at the end, this is what is said, just like Nala, succeeds in what he have uh, in and then they come together everything is resolved to them and the and the king and the queen unite once again and becomes a good story just like that you also have to go through i mean everybody if you are born a human you have to go through suffering but you have to keep your faith you have to keep your faith to yourself to your uh, beliefs to your god and so that is how so this is a beautiful story and told in many, many languages again. I, and there are, I think, more than uh, 500 versions of this text from, from uh, uh, and uh, like I said, adaptations in all the Indian languages, many, many folk tales, many performances are based on this. Then it has also gone to Southeast Asia with its own versions and with, with its own local localized versions. So uh, uh, even it has also been translated into Persian, into uh, French, into German. So it is a beautiful story. And I, if you have not read it, I would ask everybody, I would request everybody to read it. You will not be disappointed. Even in Kerala, for those, you, those who know, there is this uh, Nala Charitam by Unai Warrior, which is, which is a story in four days of Kathakali performance. It's a beautiful, extremely beautiful Kathakali performance. And in, in uh, um, Sanskrit, there is this Harsha Devas Naishadhiya Charita. A charita is a, is a kind of panegyric for a king or for, a, for exploits of a king or god. Charita is a kind of tale, so to say. So, Nala, the Naishadhiya Charita, the king of Naishadha, the Charita, the story of the king of Naishadha, it is in heavy Sanskrit and also very complex Sanskrit, which is which has its own its own grammar, its own, but it's also considered one of the Mahakavyas, one of the great. There are five Mahakavyas in Sanskrit. Mahakavya means the greater, the great poetry. So this informs uh, that kind of a uh, of a of, of, uh, there's a poetry of that order. There are many paintings 
informed. There are many, like I said, there are many performances, dances, music, sculpture, um, inscriptions, all that in, in about, based on Nala's story. But I'm showing you here a series of paintings on the Nala theme, Nala Damenti theme. The, fir the first is the Pahadi paintings. This is in the collection of, yeah, you can show that. <coughs> the next one, please. Yeah, so this is actually, there are many, I am just taking a selection. So I'll take one by one. So this is the Arati of Nala, the puja. Uh, uh, is it visible to everybody? Yes, Chi it is. Yeah? Yes. 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 If you can look closely at this. I, 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 I can see it. <laughs> yeah, that's lovely, wonderful. So, so it is a um, painting, I think, in which Nala is getting consecrated. They're making, doing a puja, they're doing an arati on him and all the courtiers are around and see the courtiers are all around and uh, some dance is happening for the sake of the king. And there are, the see, there is a kind of dance instruments that are also say there's a group of singers and the dances, dance is happening. There are courtiers around and the, see, this, the, these are other, other palaces from which other women are looking, looking on. So it's a beautiful courtly scene. The, yeah. the second one, please. Yeah, so I told you about the swan. The swan is a very important character in the Nala story. When Nala hears about this about Damenti, and he knows that she, she he didn't know that he deserved her. So her, so he's a little doubtful. Narada comes to him and says that you you are a human god. I don't think uh, you you human king. I don't think a god deserves her. You have to strive to get her. So he becomes also very happy that now he can at least try and get this. And then he, but then he becomes so besotted with her that he sort of leaves everything and he goes into the forest, into the garden, the so-called so pleasure garden. And he's just uh, just uh, staying there. At that time, a few, this flock of swans come from Brahma, from the God's own palace. And they are there in that, in that lake, in the lake, they're just going around. So then he just, and one of them is this golden swan. See, there are flo flocks of swans flying about and they're all there. And then he catches this golden swan. So the swan becomes very worried that he's going to kill me because I'm a golden swan. He wants to take all the jewels or something. Then he releases, sorry, I didn't mean to hurt you. So he releases, but then the swan comes back and says that I'm sorry, I mistook you. I am your friend. I can connect you to the main thing. So he somehow becomes the emissary for the go between between this Damenti and, and then he goes to Damenti's palace and says that see there is this wonderful king uh, who is in love with you, but he didn't have to try very hard because Damenti again was already in love with him, having heard about him from other sources. So in this one, he's releasing the swan. And he's just, he's offering to go to Vidarpa. So he's saying, okay, now you go and tell her this, please. So this is where it is. <laughs> Next one, please. Yeah, so now he has come. See, he has come to Damenti's garden. The swan is now in Damenti's garden. The, so now what he does, he's a very, very sagacious. He's a very clever swan. He somehow befriends Damenti and friends and makes the Menti go far from the 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 sakhis the the her, her friends the, the friends go far and then now he she he's alone with the Menti. they are sort of talking to each other then that is when uh, so see, the, so she's telling the kids so the in this one the the one on top she's telling the friends to stay away and so they're all going away and here and down there the two together and then then they're talking to each other and then then they talking about the love and then she also says that I am also in love with him. So please tell him that I'm also. So that's the scene. Now, after the swan goes, the she's so love lawn besotted that they are sort of fanning her and they're all getting very upset. See, they're doing some, some people are doing some medicinal 
some maybe some sandy wood or something and, and maybe rose water uh, uh, a lot of a lot of action is happening her bed is prepared but she's so upset that she that they are all doing all kinds of things for her <laughs> next one yeah so she, see she's so besotted that she she swoons she swoons and if the, the they're all in a tizzy they're all very very upset and doing again many things to her yeah right now i i told you that the gods also come and interfere in this in this after all the course of love never runs smooth they come and tell him that now you have to you are the one who is supposed to go but he says no please don't do this to me bhai me kamukan bhai me is the damanti i am also the kamukan i am also the lover of he says no but you 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 are the chosen one so they are sort of instructing him and all the all the and he, so he's kind of trying to plead with them and he's coming for he's also going for the swayamvara but he's trying to plead with them please don't do this let me let me also be he says they said no you go and give our message to her yeah. now this is a very interesting one so but actually he initially pleads how can i go people will see me then they like i told you they give him tiraskarani this uh, power by which he is invisible to others but only to the mainti he will be visible can you see this can you see this small uh, in, in the down here there is a small yeah figure can you see are you able to see the yes yes. Yes. Yeah. yes yes yeah yeah you see yeah see. look at the painter's skill to make him to create the figure at the same time make it make him as though he is invisible you know so he it is in the kathakali performance it is very funny at this part of time because he is sort of trying to jostle around and then uh, he, but then nobody is seeing seeing him so he is very amused by this also that i am i can see people but nobody can see me so that his shadow is also visible if we see sorry his shadow we can see his shadow like in the painting they've shown yeah yeah that's right that's right that's right yeah yeah, yeah. so this is the inner quarter so she's is getting there so the next one please no this one before that was yeah 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 so the next one yeah so when they then he keeps talking to her tries to talk to her but he does a very good job of his uh, very good job he says that after all you have to marry indra uh, the, or or any of the five celestials they'll be good for you they have so much of when uh, uh, you will be able to enjoy the pleasures of heaven she says i don't want the pleasures of heaven i am a human princess i want this a uh, person then he keeps on trying so trying to coax her to accept one of them but she says very firm no no then then i think in this one an invisible nala she's garlanding uh, thinking that uh, finally uh, the he she asks who are you now who are the, who are you you have to tell me who you are then he doesn't say that but then in the text she starts crying then he becomes so sympathetic to her that he says that okay i am so and so and she garlands him so this is what it is so then they talk to each other and everybody is watching everybody is watching so they talk to each other and happily uh, not happily exactly because both of them are worried that how all this is going to happen but then she says that come what may it is you who is i am going to choose and nobody else next now all the this is a, where all the princesses are going to this for the wedding wedding that is fixed by by bhima that is uh, damanti's father this is the the text actually the text where all this is it's a huge very very big text so it is just uh, we can just skip this one even the next one yeah see it is very interesting i would 
ask if anyone to everybody to read the Mandala story. Not only that, also if possible the 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 um, the uh, Sanskrit in in translation. There are some other drawings also. This is only one one uh, form of painting that I showed. So this is another very interesting form in which the Swayamvara scene is depicted in skin sketching. See, it's such a beautiful, uh, very detailed. All the courtiers are sitting, and the palace is there in in the background, and all the people are around. It's a lot of spectacle happening inside. Look, the women are there. The things. Uh, the wedding scene is in full swing. Next one. Yeah, so these they have made their choice. The, 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 she has decided to marry. So, uh, but then the people who have assembled there, the other kings are very unhappy and they're showing that. They are trying to make a rebellion. And look at the father of the bride. He's trying to appease them. And the kings are very angry. Whereas the happy situation is very much here. The, husband, the, the, the bride and the bridegroom are here, the women are here, and but then these people are showing their anger. The wedding. <laughs> and yeah, actually, if you go to the, go to the earlier one, please, the, the earlier one. Yeah, see all the gods are returning. They understand now they, they, they're, not, they're not going to be uh, uh, selected, uh, chosen by the Minti, so they're all going. So now they're going on their way back. Yeah, next, next one, the wedding and the next one, please. Yeah, so the return of gods following the Swayam. Swayamvara means the wedding, the, the cho uh, chosen wedding, the, in which somebody chooses her bride, bridegroom. Yeah, the next one. Yeah, so now they have come back to Nala's, the, the bride and the groom have come back to Nala's palace and it's the first day of their wedding, first day of their wedding. So Kala, Na, Nala is sort of bantering with Kala. Kala is her maid, her best friend. So while she's sitting in, she's playing with a lotus and she's very shy, she's sitting like that. And She's saying, I think, some teasing words, I think. So they are sort of talking in a jesting way to each other while she is very... Yeah. So uh, how to bring the, all these emotions into, you know, with these sketches is something very... So again, now she's, I think, I think she stay, stayed for a long time. Now he gets angry. She's, uh, uh, the king is asking, now you go. Just go. Go back to... And uh, let me be alone with her. You know, something like that. So then the grand dinner, look at the number of dishes. The grand dinner which made by a Brahmin and the Brahmins are eating. The courtiers are here. So the grand wedding after the wedding feast, look, somebody is serving and things are in, thal in, in plates and some things are, yeah. So this is a, this is a beautiful, description in Harsha's Naishadhiya Charita in which in the morning uh, the moon is rising I mean it is a lovely extremely evocative imagery of the moon rising and the moon and the moonlight pervading the whole universe and they are in such happy union and so that is being depicted uh, the moon rise and the, yeah and then as look at the colors color suddenly that has changed from the that yellow to the moonlight, the beautiful moonlight. So they're watching the, again, many, many verses are dedicated to the moonrise and the moonrise also in their mind also. The mind is also like a rising moon. So that is being depicted here. Yeah. So now something that at least the Kerala, uh, 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 the people from Kerala may be more familiar about. There are many more, but I have taken only a few because you can't do the, show them all with this. Okay, we can go to the next one. This, I am sure every many people must know. Am I right? This is the Devanti, the, 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 the uh, uh, princess and the swan talking to each other, which we saw in another form, another uh, tradition earlier. So this is the swan and the Damentis together. The next one. 
yeah, the swan is going and she's sort of saying bye to the swan who goes back to Nala saying that I will tell whatever you wanted to, to Nala. Now she again is after, uh, she's unhappy after he leaves, she's unhappy and the, and the friend is sort of trying to calm her saying that don't worry, everything will be all right. Now this is where, when they go, go they, they are banished into the forest. And these are actually beautiful paintings by Raja Ravi Varma. Again, a series of them. She, they are in the forest and she, out of exhaustion, she is sort of sleeping and he is trying to, and this is the time when, when she's sleeping, he's also gone crazy with the impact of all this shock. And he takes half her, her cloth vase and then he runs away from her so that he thinks that that is a way that she herself will reach some safe spot, which she does eventually. But this is a very poignant scene in this, in this story. And then she, after he goes, she doesn't know what to do. She's all alone in the forest. And so this is Ravi Varma's depiction of the main thing in her sorrow. I think, I think I end it here. And well, if, if there was, yeah. <laughs> if there is time, much more could have been said about, about the other aspects of, of Nala's story in which uh, what happens later and also the performative aspects, the sculptural as aspects, but I think I'd like to end it here and thank you. <laughs> I took Nala's story just as a kind of example of one small uh, story within this large sea of stories that the Mahabharata or, you know, or the Katha Sarit Sagara or the Panchatantra, all that depicts as a kind of small thing of literature, what literature can do to, to life and. Thank you so much, uh, Chishi. That was like a wonderful uh, lecture and it's, uh, they told us so many fascinating things and, and it's just, it's also, it makes me wonder why uh, the Nala Tamilki story is so popular. And, because maybe because there's just so much of uh, all kinds of emotions in it and just uh, but yeah. but, there are, there are, but there are, I think there are comments and there are hand raises so I think I'll uh, not uh, I have questions but I will save them to the end if uh, we let the students basically ask whatever questions so there was an interesting comment uh, that uh, Suar made so he made that comment I think when you were talking about the way the people actually remembered it's like, he says it's like modern error correcting quotes. Maybe in uh, programming, I don't know if Swar wants to say something about it, but I think other than that, we have some hand raises also. So do you want to, do you want to comment no, on that? No, it's, 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 a, it's a remarkable actually, uh, because uh, uh, when you memorize in several ways, then there's a, an opportunity uh, to, uh, uh, to make sure that the copying that uh, does not, uh, uh, its error correcting rate would be really, really low. And I've never, I haven't seen that in other cultures at all. So this is, and modern error correcting codes for communication uses exactly methods like that to make sure that whatever your, the video that I'm passing now goes uh, to the other side in the correct way without uh, the errors that occur. Some errors always occur. So exactly, really Absolutely. remarkable. This is how we you will be been right, right. I mean, whenever these texts or this knowledge happened, which may have been much earlier, many many centuries earlier, how did they? transmit to us. You're absolutely right. It's a remarkable feat of memory, which is unparalleled in the world over because one, also because of the technique that they adopted. Secondly, because of the extent of the corpus that they had to imbibe, that they had to, you know, uh, they had to memorize. Unbelievably large texts. I have large to I have to, sorry, I also comment that uh, the Bible, for example, if uh, to give another example that is that has not been done that way, there are many versions of the Bible and um, um, 
this uh, has caused a lot of uh, issues uh, and because it was not memorized in a graphical way it was memorized as stories as uh, in the content in in the content so there was no error correcting code and um, that caused a lot of problems later on I think uh, Max Muller, when he, uh, Cody, when he started uh, actually the thing, he said that he did it across the entire country and he basically recorded the things from, from all over or, or hand, uh, started writing them down. And I believe that with the exception of four words that the entire thing was exactly replicated across the entire country from all corners of the country. Right? And I think there are like hundreds of thousands of verses and they were identically preserved. Exactly, exactly. With all the exception of just my four words is all that he could find a difference. I think Anthony also has his hand raised. Anthony, did you want to ask the question? Yes. Or make a comment? Thank you. Thank you, Doc. I actually enjoyed your presentation. And uh, I was just wondering when the presentation was going on, where I saw some places you were written uh, gods, and some of them with small g, some with a capital G. Uh, these gods, were they actually in existence? Uh, uh, is it that people conferred uh, these gods on people? Or are they actually human beings? Or are they drawings uh, as we're seeing like that? So I was just wondering. Then also, the second question is that uh, when countries are bonded with each other, most of the times you see transfer of culture from one country to another. So in course of your documentation of these literatures, did you come across such uh, in terms of uh, transfer of culture or these cultures are peculiar to India? They were not transferred. Thank you. I didn't get the first question about the, about the uh, uh, paintings, right? He's asking whether he says in the writing, it was written sometimes with a small g. Uh, gods are written with a small g. And so are they actually people or they're, they're gods or... Uh, what is the difference with small g, capital G? He says asking what the difference and that's, am I, am I right, Anthony? Is that kind of what your question was, right? Yes, yeah, that, that is correct. And I also want to know whether they're actually in existence or they're just imaginary images of uh, human beings that have been put there or they, they're actually human beings. And who confer those rights to them as gods? Oh. Uh, well, uh, in which text are you talking about the small g and the and the capital G? Uh, I would like to say that if you talk generally about God, gods, for example, you can use a small g. But if you're talking about God uh, Shiva or God Indra or God Vishnu, then you're talking about the specific person, then you can use a capital G. Well, that's a, well, what I feel as a distinction. It's, there is another way also of interpreting it is uh, when they talk about gods, uh, I think, uh, Anthony, they, in India, they say they have uh, 33 crore gods, which is yeah. like, those are millions of gods, like that's 330 million gods. So, and all natural forces are considered uh, divine. So the air is divine, the sun is divine, the water is divine. So all, everything in nature is basically divine. And so you have millions of gods and so when we different like uh, what uh, ma'am said when you talk about the collective you often use a small g but when you're talking about the absolute uh, consciousness like we discussed in some of our earlier classes then you use the capital g that's the one uh, underlying entity or underlying existence that is there which is all pervasive that you use the capital g normally for but when you're talking about gods in the collective you often use a small g and you're trying to make that distinction um, by saying you're actually referring to elements that you, that uh, are reflecting of uh, divinity but you're not talking about uh, the supreme beings i hope that makes sense also yes it does so it means that oh, uh, animals too are gods. Does, is that how it works? Yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay. Also in Explain. Hindi Thank and Sanskrit, there are no capitalizations per se. Yeah. So the exactly. original, original exactly. texts were in Sanskrit or Hindi, there were no capitalization. No, no. Only, only in English, when you try to yeah, translate them into them, only then it becomes, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Then my second question was uh, in terms of uh, countries that are bound to each other, like in India, where you have other countries like Bangladesh, you have China, you have uh, Pakistan bound with uh, India, sharing boundaries with India. You have this transfer of uh, culture from uh, 
I don't know whether my question is in line with this uh, class. Well, you have transport culture. That's a wonderful question. That's a wonderful question. Definitely, definitely. I mean, uh, like I said, I that's why the bridge. I use the metaphor of bridge again. The I don't think we are we are uh, bound by these boundaries at all. For example, Sufi music. Uh, so it is not in India. Uh, it is also you can share it with Bangladesh. You can share it with. Uh, with uh, with uh, uh, Pakistan, you can share it with Afghanistan. So, for example, Buddhism. What about Buddhism? We say that Buddhism started in India, but it took root in Nepal, in Bhutan, in China, in went to the northeast, to Korea, to Japan. So, I don't think that there is. A, uh, it's not just about Southeast Asia, but uh, the whole zone, the shared culture. With the with the same roots but different branches, I would like to say. Thank you so much. And one more point, I think, like in Japan, they actually have in the ancient uh, Japanese thing, they actually have like Ganesha as one of their gods. They don't call it Ganesha; they have another name for it, which starts with an S. I don't remember what it's called, but uh, the same kind of uh, the thing with a half elephant, a half is, is there even in Japan? So the culture was very mixed. Uh, all across uh... absolutely absolutely right yeah mm -hmm. also if we talk about urdu so urdu is the national language of pakistan as well as bangladesh but it actually start in delhi like in delhi area so it was here where it was first scripted and written down so when we see it like that uh, their language actually came in from india India through Persia through again through the yes. other side also it is not india alone but again which brought been uh, been by like I said, it could be by trade, it could be by exchanges, it could be by scholars coming. You know, many many scholars came, took manuscripts, took the uh, culture and went away, spread it there. So it's one great, uh, uh, you know, uh, give and take. I would say exchange. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Also, I was reading, ma'am, Hindi and Urdu. It kind of, they say that its inception started actually in India. And yes, uh, like we have Ghalib and yeah. all these, uh, yes. So all of these people were actually like, they're called the forefathers, like, you know, of the language of Urdu. And uh, again, I can be wrong, but it was something that I read long time back and I found it super interesting. Like, okay, wow, Urdu, I never knew that it, you know, actually was well loved in India and stuff. So yes. Yes, it is called Hindustani and then it had many, many uh, regional vari variations also depending on where it was spoken. For example, if it's in Lucknow, it's, it's actually, yeah, like you said, exactly like you said, it, it begins somewhere through some kind of exchanges, transmissions, uh, uh, you know, we are getting localized and taking its own like, name and habitation. And so that's how it happens, languages, cultures, pervade from one and transmit from one to the other. They change in the process, but they also adapt. And then they become, that becomes the core and that gets changed. It's such a fascinating story of how culture adapts and reinvents. Cultures, so to say, it's not even culture. Everything, you can't say culture in, in, in the singular, it is cultures. My culture is the same as I mean, it's as important as your culture and you know, my language. So there is no big, low, high, low, uh, the, nothing like that. It's all part of one continuum in that sense. Is there anybody else with a question for uh, ma'am? Uh, and may I recommend that uh, if you haven't already done so, you should uh, look up uh, sahabpedia.org. Uh, Please go ahead. Somebody has a question? Yeah. Um, yeah, can I, uh, sorry. Uh, are there any known um, um, texts that were not preserved? Should not like preserve. they were written upon... Uh, that uh, there was some text that uh, we don't know how to. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand what I'm saying. <laughs> it's a very, very difficult question to answer, though. Uh, I, uh, 
I, we had uh, to, to, to give you one example, the Vedic corpus that we talked about, there were more than uh, 1,000 to uh, 1,100 shakhas, branches of Vedic learning. Now, what we have at present, which is preserved, when I was doing the UNESCO, what, what uh, uh, Dr. Bhavani was speaking about, uh, 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 this was in nine, uh, 2001 when I was when we were doing the documentation for UNESCO to make it the human the, the the world heritage. There were only 12 shakhas left, and now in 2021, I don't know if there are 12 shakhas that are still there. So it is a alarmingly so many things have we what we have lost is much much more than what we have as of now. But even now we are losing languages. So many languages are getting lost for want of people to, and standardization. People just want to speak in English or in the or in you know uh, uh, everything is going. The, the 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 specificity of cultures is really getting lost to a lot of you know uh, standardization and uh, depletion. Why would this you I think that there's kind of a the race between the uh, technology, which would allow me to speak in Hebrew and you to reply in Hindu, uh, versus that would allow the like return of the languages, I guess, versus that standardization that you're talking about. So whoever wins first, um, I guess. And also young people, you know, it, it has to percolate to younger people. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, I mean, there's no point in these things, scholars speaking to scholars, and it doesn't retain like that. It has to come to the people, come to the uh, younger people taking it up, and then, you know, otherwise it will not. How, how will the next generation know that we, at least our gen my generation had this much. The next becomes even more depleted. It goes like that, you know, even my, my parents or my, grand my grandparents knew much more than I know. It is. I I think. Uh, uh, I think Anushri has a comment that uh, she she can raise. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for this um really interesting talk. Um, I find it so fascinating that um we can look at these paintings. Usually you see them as murals, um, the religious ones you see in temples, but something like this you might see at a hotel, like a big wall of just paintings. And you can just go and look and follow the story without reading anything, just by looking at the pictures. I find that so, so fascinating in um, Indian culture. And the thing is, you might not know, like your slides had headings. Let's say you go to a hotel and you see this mural, there's no headings, but you see this one and then you know what this story is about. I think yeah. that, that's really so great. So thank you for sharing this aspect with us um, and also sharing those paintings because I never knew, now I, now I can look at them. You see them sometimes in a market or something and you don't realize that it's a character being portrayed you just think it's just a nice painting so that's great to know thank you very much i'm glad that i i well, that you you people like the painting i was actually wondering should i have been showing a series of paintings or show a performance of the same thing in the same text so maybe another time maybe like i promise to Dr. Bhavani sometime later when I will have the chance to visit uh, um, uh, <laughs> Amritapuri once again, maybe I'll be able to show another, a totally different aspect and then be as, as interesting because there is so much richness in our culture, you know, the diversity and richness that it is, you can look at it from any point of view and a window gets opened, you know, to the infinity of riches. I have another question. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, uh, what about the Harappan language? They say it's still not been deciphered and 
I don't know if it is and how far we are in deciphering what it means because if we get that, I think we'll hit the lottery. <laughs> Yeah, many people say that this is, uh, many people have had claims that they have deciphered. Some people say that they're pictorial, they're very hieroglyphic kind of mm -hmm. thing. But then I don't think there is any no. anything very conclusive and universally accepted that that it has been deciphered, not yet. Maybe it is your generation who might do it, who knows? <laughs> I read a uh, book, ma'am, on that, uh, a textbook. Uh, I don't remember who it was. It was, I think, probably like a thesis. Uh, it was a very interesting thing how they actually they actually uh, they don't say it's hieroglyphical they say it's actually phonetical and then they have this whole script uh, mapped out to phonetics and they said that uh, for example the the there is no vowel representation in that it's only consonant representation and they kind of analyzed almost all the tablets that are there and i actually remember reading a whole book on it and i thought that was a very fascinating one but yeah. I have never seen that one quoted or, or uh, referred to by any anybody. It's just an, a book that was on its own that I had read. Um, yeah, like you said, probably many that are not. Uh, Actually, there are many, many such, uh, such people have come together and then have tried to do. Where is Professor Witzel uh, uh, of Harvard, one of those universe, US universities has done a lot of work. There is this, uh, Tamil um, scholar who just recently passed away, uh, who has done tremendous work on, on trying to decipher this. Many people have, but you're right. I mean, it, it's, but nothing conclusive and, you know, like I said, universally accepted. And it has not yet come, uh, come into that much of yet. I think uh, uh, there's one more person with a hand raised. Ma Martin has his hand raised. Uh, Martin, do you have a question? Yes, thank you very much, Professor. Very interesting um, session. I just want to find out um, the, the paintings, how were they preserved? Um, how were they preserved? I mean, I'm sure there are so many, many thousands of years old how were they preserved and secondly from your work do you think that the stories that were recorded um focused mainly on the elites in those times or covered both the minority and the kind of the minority group the lower caste in the higher caste and all that did, did the stories cover every aspect of the society or just focused on the kind of kings, the queens, and you know those who had uh, the the uh, money in those days. Uh, Thank you, power. Yeah, yeah those in authority. Yeah. Thank you. So, very good questions. Uh, well, the first one, the paintings belong to different periods. I mean, you can see paintings right from from the ninth century, tenth centuries. Uh, uh, there are paintings that are preserved even much before. Um, but then, you know, you have to have some material to preserve. Uh, you know about the rock paintings of Bhim Bhedka and all that. There are many rock paintings in which the first, I mean, that those belong to before BC, you know, there are the, so paintings have always been there. Uh, people expressed just like people expressed in dance and music by jumping in any uh, imitating nature, for example, same way they wrote, they also speak, they also pictured whatever they saw, maybe their nature paintings, maybe they are about animals that they saw, and then there are agricultural practices. So they so it also evolved as human race evolved, painting systems also evolved. But these that you have seen, some I think are around the 18th century and some uh, are the, the Revivarma paintings are much slightly later, 19th century and thereabouts. So they're, they're in different, and the, uh, you may have also, what you were talking about that the story in a, in a hotel that you were saying, this must be Kerala mural paintings, perhaps. The, the mural paintings are a very vibrant tradition from Kerala. They again started sometime in the 13th, 14th century. And now, of course, and they, they, 
they did a lot of temple paintings again stories that i'm talking about the bhagavata stories or the mahabharata stories or the ramayana stories and again episodes from krishna's life for example krishna uh, born then krishna as a as a playing then all those things were painted in everywhere so you can't date them like that but your the second question about whether the the other class or the, were way paintings only courtly about courtly life no no not at all there are many many scenes of of you know um, a folk life of worldly life and there's many like that also it's not just paintings are not always confined to gods and kings and alone and there are also people who after all it's people who paint them so there are such depictions also There's a comment in the chat that Nitesh uh, has yes. contributed to Sahapedia on sacred groups, so of Kerala. So he contributed to I think the article or what uh, he's saying on sacred groups. It's just uh, wonderful, comment. wonderful. Thank you, thank you for that information. Yes, I I know that. that uh, namaste, ma'am. I am Amritesh. Actually, oh, okay. I, I was there in the 2017 fellowship. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So bad, I was there. Actually, so wonderful, wonderful. Bhavani ma'am has recommended, she has shared the reference with us based on that we have uh, done the research. And right now I am working on the same topic itself in my PhD. So it was my uh, a startup on, on that Sahapedia research. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Very privileged. <laughs> okay. Thank you ma'am, thank you so much. Thank you. And we have one more hand raised, ma'am. I don't know if you have uh, uh, the time for it, but we have one more hand raised from Juliet. Uh, she has a hand raised. Juliet? Hello. Good evening, Ma. Good evening. Thank you for uh, a very beautiful presentation. I really enjoyed the folk tale. Listening step by step, watching the presentation slides, the photos, they were really very nice. It triggered something that I would wish you to, to clarify for me. When um, I look at the title of your, your presentation, that is literature as a, bridging, as a bridging cultures and Indian perspective. When I listened to you, I realized, yes, we do have um, a very strong culture born in India based on the story that you relayed. I'm going to pick from two of uh, my colleagues, Anushri's statement and Martin's statement. Martin talked about um, whether the cultures are basically cross-cutting, cross you know, from the upper class up to the lower class. And then Anushri talked about um, interpreting the invisible photo, you know, whereby you look at a photo and you're able to interpret it. Mine is um, a mixture of both of what they're saying. I'm asking, would it be right to say that there exists an invincible culture above the culture that we can see? Why my question is coming is- I'm sorry, what is it, what, what, what culture? Is there an invisible culture above the culture that we can see? Why I'm asking, I'm picking it from um, one of them. Um, the slides, I think there were quite a number of the slides, especially when the princess, I, I can't quite pronounce her name, she's the, the somebody, when the princess talks to that dove, you know, and then the dove takes the message to the prince, and then the prince sends the dove back. That invisible communication, that is the invisible culture that I'm talking about. That culture does exist within our society. You know, we can't really cast on stone the way we say that um, there is this culture about um, the Hindus follow this, the Christians follow this, the Muslims follow this. Uh, there's something, there's something there, that invisible culture that exists. Would it be right for a scholar to say it does exist and how can we relay this invisibility, you know, out there? That is my question. <laughs> I would like to uh, put it slightly differently. Rather than invisible, I would like to uh, phrase it as introspective. Uh, I think all art comes from introspection. 
without without something i mean you can get a lot from outside world but you can also get from but if it is not processed within you if it is not seasoned with your own uh, uh, you know you may call it invisible you can call it your uh, reflective i mean that aspect without that it cannot be expressed as art and i think everyone goes through that process when they make art i mean after it has to it is not something that you just take from nature and then you just present it as it is you know you it has to go through so i think you are absolutely right i'm just like nala had to go invisible to get uh, to to go to the menti and then get, uh, then talk to her as, as an invisible i had she, he just gone like that in his own uh, you know visible form it may not have been as impactful as you're so right i mean it is absolutely true that art is a reflection of that what you call invisible but or what you call as i mean what i would like to call as a reflectivity of your own your uh, of what you get seasoned or tempered with your own life's assessment and then of course your own engagement with that something beyond which you can name it in whichever you may want i think that is wonderful thank you so much thank you hello ma'am good evening also you said about culture and bridging you asked whether why why did you say it as uh, how was it connected to the uh, so i'd like to say like i after all this lecture now that i have given all this i'm i'd like to say that bridging is all about cross cultural communication it can be about two cultures it can be two languages coming together which i was talking about it can also be between languages for example the local language and the and the primary also the, the other language that was you uh, know uh, superimposed on that it can be about folk and uh, folk and so called classical i mean some people say that i have a, a classical everything becomes so you know in interwoven and one uh, at two sides of the same coin so in that sense i think bridging is a is a is a very useful metaphor in my understanding. that's why i used it in that sense thank you i think uh, we don't have any more hand raises um yeah uh okay so um so we don't have any more questions so i think ma'am we took uh, teacher we took about an hour and a half of your time is uh, but it was very well uh worth for uh, for us it was a pleasure and i think we can still go on i have myself a whole bunch of questions that i would love love to ask you uh especially in the way the role of the meter of the vedas may have played in in terms of preservation and stuff like that but um but i think it's it's an hour and a half is is a long time and so um i i hope do hope that we have a, a we can continue this conversation a little bit more uh, with a little bit more uh, depth especially for a lot of students who are actually seriously also looking into culture as a main element of their uh, uh phds and there are some people who are really focusing on on the cultural aspect of it i think for them to have more in depth conversations with you would be something that is would be very precious for them and um that i really like to thank you again for your the time that you spent uh, in 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 talking to us and preparing uh the material and sharing with us uh, there's just so many so many things and and when you were talking there's just so many branches that we could have explored in just in terms of uh, culture uh, and uh, i thank you for opening all those worlds i hope uh, that we also will discuss some of the things that you brought up in this uh, lecture in our classes when we uh, continue thank, you, thank so you so much it was such a great pleasure i'm really so happy to have come and thank you sir sarla for do this and then thank you so much dr bhavani and thanks to every each and every one of you who asked the questions and who participated thank you thank you bye bye and thank you everybody for showing up and having your cameras on i think you can all say bye now and thank ma'am
bye bye thank you thank you thank you everyone thank you bye thank you very much prof good night thank you so much good night okay she's up now yeah, I'm going to stop recording.